Welcome everyone to episode 62 of the Stanford MOSIS seminar series. Uh, I'm Kern, and as always, we have with us um, Piero, Fyodor, and Hello. our guest today, as well as co-host uh, Dan. Hey. So um, Dan's going to be talking to us today about his work on contrastive learning and telling us a little bit about what he's been up to in the last, uh, I guess, six ish months. Um, and as always, we're going to have a 30 minute talk followed by a 30 minute podcast style discussion where you in the live YouTube audience can ask questions and uh, you can put those questions in chat during the talk. Um, and then we'll get those across to uh, Dan uh, during the podcast. A bit about Dan, uh, you already know him pretty well, but um, he is a PhD student in uh, Chris Ray's lab at Stanford. Uh, he's also co-advised uh, by Kayvon Fadahalian, um, and he focuses on understanding the principles behind why machine learning works and using that to build the next generation of machine learning systems. Uh, and he's supported by an NDSAG uh, fellowship. He also is a uh, avid scuba diver um, and shows us a lot of pictures of that often. Uh, so Dan, do you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, thanks, Karan, for that intro. Um... I am an avid scuba diver. Maybe one day I'll, I'll show some, some things on the seminar. Um, yeah, so my name is Dan. Today I'm going to be talking about some work on supervised contrastive learning. So this work is split between a few papers, and I'll primarily kind of be talking about it in today's talk in, in two parts. So to set the stage, first I'll be talking about how to improve the transfer learning and robustness characteristics of a technique called supervised contrastive learning. And we'll talk about how kind of the key thing is addressing two challenges in the representation space. So that's balancing the amount of geometric spread in the embeddings and addressing a property that we call class fixing permutation invariance. We'll see how some simple tricks to, to do this result in better transfer learning and robustness performance. And I want to call out, this is a great set of work uh, that, that I did um, with Mei Yi Chen. Then in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about how we took some of those insights and applied them to open domain NTD retrieval. And the long and short of it is by incorporating a type aware supervised contrastive loss, we can vastly improve performance on rare entities. And this work was primarily led by my lab mate, Megan. So let's start with part one, improving transfer and robustness of supervised contrastive learning. So here's a rundown of what I'll be covering in this section. So first I'll give some background about contrastive learning, both the supervised and the unsupervised kinds and how we kind of got interested in this transfer question in the first place. Then I'll talk about two technical challenges with understanding how to get a good representation with supervised contrastive learning. I'll follow up with the components of our solution, which we call Thanos, and the theoretical guarantees on how it addresses the two challenges. Finally, I'll conclude by evaluating Thanos on transferability and robustness. So first, let's start with some background on contrastive learning. So contrastive learning has emerged recently as a popular method to train visual representations. The central abstraction is taking an anchor, like that dog on the left, and pulling its representation closer to other images, for example, that crop of the dog's head, and pushing it away from other images, like that elephant or those cats. In self-supervised contrastive learning, which is also known as InfoNCE, the positives are different random augmentations of the same image. So the positives are the things that you pull together. And the negatives are all the other images in the batch. So if you look at that part, that picture on the left, this can result in something a little bit weird. So you end up pushing dogs away from other dogs. So that dog in the red, the one, the, the, the black and white one, is being pushed away from the fluffy dog. What the supervised contrastive folks realized was that you could actually take this strategy and turn it into a supervised loss by pulling together points from the same class and only pushing away points from different classes. And that's what you see on the right with the supcon loss. So the dog highlighted in green is now positive and the negatives are all the animals that are not dogs. And in this setting, you can actually pull the dogs closer together. What they found when they did this is that performance ends up being pretty good and even better than traditional ways of doing supervised learning. So that's what you see on the left. The purple line is supervised contrastive learning, and the other lines are kind of more traditional ways of doing contrast uh, of doing of training models like cross entropy. The way I think about explaining why this helps is that you get a bit more information when you train contrastively. At a high level, when you're training a model in a, in a traditional way with something like cross entropy, you just have a list of examples and you're just really asking your model to memorize all those examples one at a time. 
when you train contrastively, you almost ask the model to think about relationships between between points. And a lot of people have made the argument that this is potentially closer to how people might learn. So because of those properties, that, that's you know pretty great for overall accuracy. But when people started taking a closer look at what this loss function does, they noticed that the loss function actually causes the representations to collapse in the limit. So that's what you see on the right, those blue dots, all the different cats that, that you see all get represented by the exact same blue dot. So that means that the representation is actually losing those fine grain details. It's not able to distinguish between a sleeping cat or a jumping cat or a picture of a cat head on or a cat that's trying to swat at a bug. You might expect that losing those fine grain details isn't great for a model, isn't great for a representation, and you'd be right there. So here's an example from a recent paper that showed that transfer learning performance isn't that great with supervised contrastive learning. And in, uh, for transfer learning, that's when you train a model to do one thing and try to figure out if you can do something else. That's a pretty critical evaluation for us these days because that's how most models are used these days. So that paper found that adding back in a self-supervised contrastive loss to the supervised contrastive learning helps with transfer learning. So that dark blue line, that's the or the solid blue line, that's the transfer learning performance. And the further you go right, you get more self-supervised loss and better transfer learning performance. But there was also a trade-off with the overall performance. So that's that dotted red line. So as you increase the weight of the self-supervised loss, the accuracy of the overall model goes down. Heuristically, they tied this effect to some geometric spread properties. That's what's being shown on the bottom right. If you add back in the info and T loss, it seems to heuristically, quote unquote, spread out the representations in feature space. So that motivated sort of the central question of our work. How can we understand these effects? Is it possible to exploit our understanding to get even better transferability and maybe some other properties that we'd like, such as robustness? So the first technical challenge is getting a more precise understanding of the spread phenomenon and figuring out how to control it. So it turns out spread is actually pretty delicate to control. So on the very far left, that's what you get with SoupCon, that you get the class collapse. On the far right, you can end up with too much spread with an info and C loss and end up with a uniform geometry. So in the first case, we lose those fine grained details. In the, in the far right case, we're going to lose information about the classes themselves. So what we want to do is we kind of want to balance these two forces in a way we can get an optimal geometry that looks something like what's in the middle. Part of the challenge here is that analyzing these losses and kind of understanding them theoretically is very difficult. So existing analysis approaches run into classical problems uh, in that go back as far as electrostatic potential theory. A lot of the problems in this area, such as the, the Thompson problem, are more than a century old or still open problems. Um, and you know, if the physicists can't solve them, then they're probably pretty hard. So our analysis is going to kind of be fundamentally constrained by the difficulty of the problem here. The second technical challenge comes from an observation that spread alone is kind of not enough to get to guarantee good transfer. And the reason is that the geometric spread property is invariant to permutations of assignments within classes. So that what that means is you could randomly swap two points in the class and you get the same amount of spread, the same value in the contrastive loss. Uh, if you think back to, to the cats, what that means is you could put a jumping cat near the sleeping cat or near the flying cat and the loss function would basically have the same, uh, same value. But in reality, you don't really, you can't just permute points like this. So the geometry within the classes is also important. So if you look on the right here, these are two models that have the same amount of uh, spread per class, but different subclass geometries. Uh, so, and both of these geometries have the same spread, but they have pretty radically different transfer performance. So we have to break this class fixing permutation invariance and choose a mapping that will end up being good for transfer learning. In particular, we're going to want one that has good subclass clustering properties, kind of like what you see on the left, where those dotted black lines separate out those subclasses into relatively um, nice chunks. The classic way to do this from a machine learning perspective is to assume that your encoder is smooth, or the technical term here is something called Lipschitzness. So if you've ever studied generalization bounds, this is where we get into all the arguments about overfitting, how many parameters a model has, yada, yada. Unfortunately, modern deep networks are so powerful that they can very easily break Lipschitz assumptions. So there's been evidence that modern deep networks are powerful enough to fit arbitrary labels. So kind of assumptions about model smoothness are pretty naive in today's landscape. 
So how do we solve these two technical challenges? So our approach will consist of two components that individually address the two challenges that we've gone over, uh, that we've just gone over, which are balancing spread and breaking that permutation invariance. So the first component of our solution is a loss function that we call L spread. So this is a weighted sum of the supervised contrastive loss term, that's the term on the left, and a class conditional info NCE loss. You can just think of a class conditional info NCE loss as an info NCE loss that only operates on individual classes. So it's only going to be spreading out the cats or the dogs or uh, each of the other animals on their own. Intuitively and kind of based on previous work, so the, the, that loss on the left is going to try to create class collapse. The one on the right is going to try to create uniformity. So we were able to show that there exists a range of weights for that weight alpha that avoids both the collapsed and the uniform uh, geometries and instead gives us a representation that kind of obtains the best of both as shown in the middle. So I want to call out how we overcame the analysis challenges here. Basically, instead of trying to analyze a whole loss function end to end, we constructed a simple family of distributions where there is some spread. Then we directly computed the value of the loss function on that family of distributions and compared that to the loss of either extreme. What we found is that the loss of the distributions that we constructed is going to be lower than the loss at either extreme. So that's some evidence that we would find spread in practice. So that result doesn't totally characterize exactly what the distribution is going to be, but it does suggest that using L spread can give you a spread out geometry. One of the points of our result is that getting spread kind of carefully depends on setting that alpha weight appropriately. And if you go look at our paper, we derive some concrete values between which we think that our family of distributions uh, has a lower loss than either extreme, so you should get some loss there. So next we need to figure out how to break class fixing permutation invariance. So as we've discussed, assuming that your encoder is Lipschitz gives you results that can give you a good geometry, but it's a pretty unrealistic assumption for today's neural networks. So instead, we propose two alternate approaches. The first is adding in a class conditional auto uh, a class conditional autoencoder, and an autoencoder is a network that is just trained to take an image and recreate it. So if your model does this, this intuitively encourages better preservation of the fine details in the input space. This turns out to be pretty good because it does end up giving you some nice clustering properties. If you make a reverse Lipschitzness assumption on just the encoder, just the decoder, which is the second half of that network. Because it's just the second half, that ends up being a weaker assumption than end-to-end -end Lipschitzness. Another alternative that we look at is looking at L spread or these contrastive loss functions with augmentations. So that's actually pretty standard for most contrastive setups. But what we showed is that when you add augmentations like this, you can break permutation invariance with a weaker assumption, which is just assuming smoothness over augmentations. And when we measure both of these conditions, we find that the latter two uh, assumptions are more realistic to the former, and you can actually go look at our paper and see, look at the Lipschitzness constants, and the constants for the latter two assumptions are weaker than the constant for the for the first one. So now, so now I'll go into some of our results. So first, how do we bring our insights together? So we brought our insights together and proposed a method that we call Thanos to modify the supervised contrastive loss. So that's adding in a class conditional info NC loss with data augmentation and a class conditional autoencoder to the supcon loss. And our method balances the geometry between class collapse and uniformity and preserves subgroup clusters. And that's actually you know, where we get our name from. Uh, we like to think that our spread is perfectly balanced like all things should be. We find that Thanos in, uh, does achieve our goal. So on a course defined transfer learning evaluation, which is when you train on course classes like uh, animals versus vehicles, and then you evaluate on fine classes like uh, identify all the animals, all the different species. Uh, on this task, Thanos achieves significant lift over supervised contrastive or you know various ablations where we take out the autoencoder or the class conditional bits, et cetera. On average, we see about 11.1 points of lift on over five tasks over supervised contrastive. It doesn't end there. We also see improvements in worst group robustness. So here's an evaluation on some challenging robustness data sets where the, the thing that you need to do here is there are some hidden subgroups in these data sets that if you just kind of train naively, it'll do very poorly on. So you can imagine this isn't great because when you train your model, you don't want it to underperform on some specific subpopulation. So the goal in this, these worst group robustness evaluations is how do you get good performance on the, on the worst performing subpopulation uh, without knowing what those subpopulations are. 
So on average across these three tasks, we see 4.7 points of lift over uh, previous state of the art, up to 11 points over state of the art on syllab A. In one case, or in a couple cases, we found that we can even outperform a method that does have access to the hidden uh, to the hidden subpopulations, and that's a little bit you know crazy to think about because there's this method that knows which subpopulations it needs to not do badly on, and our method, which doesn't know anything about the subpopulations, can actually uh, do better than that method. So that's a wrap on the first half of the talk. So in summary, there's two key ideas for improving transferability and robustness. First, you have to balance the geometric spread, which you can do with a class conditional info and CE loss. Second, you have to induce subclass clustering, which you can do with a class conditional autoencoder and by using data augmentations. So a few of the people who worked on this effort on the right, on the left, a uh, couple links to papers, blog posts, some code. That QR code in the top right will also take you to the blog post where you can find everything else. And that kind of brings us to part two of the talk. And this is where we're going to apply insights from supervised contrastive learning to open domain entity retrieval. So first, let's see some intuition about what is entity retrieval. So imagine we have some query, what team did Julius Caesar play for? You can imagine this in your favorite voice assistant or some search app or something like that. A standard approach to answering the query is to use a model to get relevant documents from a knowledge base, You know, figure out who Julius Caesar is and then use a model to extract or generate an answer using the retrieved documents. So we're going to be focusing on the first step of that process, which is called entity retrieval. And it's kind of a key step in a lot of open domain ta tasks, such as question answering, search, fact checking. So entity retrieval ends up being pretty challenging for rare entities, which you know sometimes are also known as tail entities, especially the ones that share a name with other more popular entities. So let's say I just search for Julius Caesar. So the first entity that probably comes to mind is the, is the Roman general. So in a sample of Wikipedia, 79% of mentions of Julius Caesar actually refer to the Roman general. So if somebody says Julius Caesar and you think of the general, you're probably likely to be correct. But if I update the query with more context and ask the original question, what team did Julius Caesar play for? State-of-the-art models are still going to predict Julius Caesar, the Roman general. But this isn't quite correct. In this case, we're actually looking for Julius Caesar, the cricket player, and we wanted to figure out what cricket team he plays for. So in this ACL paper, Chen and I L found that state of the art exhibit these popularity biases and will often just choose a more popular entity over the correct tail entity. So why do we care about the tail? So practically, it's you know very uh, important for real world applications. Famously, this uh, large tech company called Microsoft ignored the long tail in their search and then created this product called Bing. Intellectually, intellectually, this is also where disambiguation is is a bit more interesting. So while models, if with if they just predict the popular entities, they can get them correct by just predicting the one that is mentioned most frequently. That strategy doesn't really work for rare entities. So instead, the model has to learn to reason about the context to retrieve the rare entity over the more popular entity. So let's go back to example and figure out how would we uh, disambiguate this and solve this as a human. What we would do is we would kind of see the words team and play and realize that we have to start looking for an athlete named Julius Caesar. We're not really looking for the Roman general anymore. So the intuition is that type-based reasoning, so the type of Julius Caesar is an athlete, that type-based reasoning can help overcome popularity biases. But it can be challenging for models to learn this type-based reasoning when they only have unstructured text. The intuition is it's very hard for a model to learn that it should be thinking about athletes if you never told it what an athlete is. So to enforce this type-based reasoning, we start bringing in some outside information, incorporating knowledge graph types into the training procedure. A bit of background about knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs store structured data about entities. Each entity has a node in the knowledge graph, and the edges indicate relationships to other entities. One of these uh, edges can be the type relation, which tells us the categories of the entity. For example, in this graph over here, we have Julius Caesar, Babe Ruth, Michael Jordan are all athletes. Now, there are several challenges with using knowledge graph types for entity retrieval for open domain tasks. So the first challenge is that all the existing methods that incorporate uh, knowledge graph types into uh, disambiguation or retrieval are designed for a setting called entity disambiguation. And that's when you have markers telling you where the mention is in the query. So bootleg, one of the prior works from our lab, this is an example of one of those systems.
in the open domain setting, the only thing you have is the unstructured query text. So you only have the question. You don't necessarily know that you're looking to disambiguate Julius Caesar. So to use these methods, uh, a system like bootleg would need to add a separate mention detection stage, and that can actually lead to significant drops in quality. Second, to be useful as an entity retriever, the model still has to do well on popular entities. So that means you have to balance leveraging the context and leveraging the popularity priors. The third challenge with using types is that the type information can be pretty incomplete, possibly noisy. So in our training data set, we're able to get types for about 75% of queries. And this is a case where we're in kind of one of the well, most well-resourced domains. Uh, that's English Wikipedia and using Wikidata types. So we'd expect these rates to be much lower for low resource domains like other languages or uh, kind of specialized uh, specialized topics. So methods that incorporate knowledge graph types need to be robust to incomplete and noisy type information if they're to be more broadly useful. So the key question in our work is, can we use types to improve the retrieval of rare entities for open domain NLP tasks? Our method builds on recent bi-encoder models for entity retrieval. A bi-encoder consists of a query encoder and an entity encoder. So the query encoder is going to encode the question. The entity encoder is going to encode all the different uh, documents that you might need to answer that question. And these encoders both produce embeddings. So at test time, or when you're trying to use th this model, you just use nearest neighbor search to retrieve the closest entity embeddings to your query embedding. And the way the the reason that this is kind of getting back to contrastive learning is that bi-encoders are often trained contrastively by forming the positive pairs over queries and the right entity that you need to answer the query. So the standard training for procedure for bi-encoders ends up being type unaware. So here we're showing embeddings of queries and entities with different types in different colors. We can see that entity embeddings of the same type are spread throughout the space. So you see some blues and purples near each other, uh, some purples all over the place, greens are split up. So given the query, what team does Julius Caesar play for? The model is likely to map it to the general since, the, since during the training, the model has mostly seen queries mentioning Julius Caesar the general. As a result, the model is going to be incorrect for our athlete query because we're looking for an athlete, not a general. So to overcome popularity biases, our idea is to more strongly encode types in the embedding space kind of geometrically so that the entities and queries of the same type end up being close together. So what we do specifically is we introduce a supervised contrastive loss function that forms pos positive pairs over queries based on types. So this will pull together queries embedding, query embeddings of the same type and push apart query embeddings of a different type. So as a result, the embeddings are encouraged to better cluster by type in the embedding space. And you can see that in the figure where uh, everything that's the same color is near each other on the, on the circle. At test time, the query encoder is more likely to retrieve a rare entity that matches the type of the query over a more popular entity of an incorrect type. So the query, what team did Julius Caesar play for? That should be mapped to the athlete region of the embedding space so that Julius Caesar, the cricketer, and not the general, can be retrieved. So Tabby's loss is a weighted combination of two supervised contrastive terms. So the first term pulls together queries of the same type, while the second term pulls together queries and their gold entities. So a couple other things that we do a bit different from previous bi-encoders, we also train over data from multiple open domain tasks and Wikipedia hyperlinks simultaneously. And we actually find that this also helps with tail retrieval. So here's some teasing visualizations of three different sets of entity embeddings where the different colors are different entity types. So Tabby, the one on the far right, achieves the best type clustering in uh, when we include types in the contrastive loss. So that's what's shown on the right. If you kind of compare it to the other two options, it's a lot more muddy. Um, those two options are a lot more muddy than, than using Tabby. So now let's look at a few of our experiments. So for our experiments, we wanted to validate three claims. So first, we wanted to validate that Tabby improves the tail retrieval performance. And so we'll, we're going to do that with a benchmark called Amber. Second, we wanted to validate that Tabby maintains a strong overall retrieval performance. And for that, we'll look at a benchmark called Kilt. And third, we wanted to check how well, how robust Tabby is to noisy and missing types. So for the first one on Amber, kind of the, the tail performance, we find that even without types, Tabby is already uh, significantly improving over all the shelf retrievers. So uh, the way you read this graph is the purple is the uh, performance over kind of the, the popular entities, and the blue is the performance of the over the tail entities. 
So we think a lot of this lift is coming from training on multitask data, such as uh, what genre what genre trains on. When you add in the type and force loss, you get an additional uh, six points of improvement in top one retrieval over the tail. Next, we're going to look at the kilt benchmark. So here we're finding that Tabby's tail retrieval doesn't hurt its average retrieval for the popular entities. So the kilt benchmark largely contains popular entities. And here we're reporting baselines of Tabby compared to a bunch of other uh, baselines from the kilt leaderboard. See that Tabby performs very similarly to genre, um, uh, actually outperforms by one point. So even though we weren't really uh, intending to uh, focus on the popular entities, we also still see a little bit of lift there. Next, since knowledge graphs can be incomplete, type labels can be noisy, we're interested in seeing how robust Tabby is in settings with missing and incorrect type information. So that graph on the left, that, left, that simulates missing types. So we're just synthetically removing very amounts of types from the training example. So we start from 80% uh, coverage on the very right, which is all the types we were able to find. And then we can just keep cutting down. We can go as far down as 5% type coverage. And even there, Tabby is still uh, obtaining much of its gains from the type loss. So that's pretty exciting because it suggests that Tabby may be useful in domains where it's more difficult to automatically assign types to the training data, and maybe you can only get types for, for a small percentage of the data. Next, uh, on the right, we have noisy types. So here we're randomly replacing the types with incorrect types. So the red line indicates a top one accuracy without types, and we see uh, kind of a natural or a, a, a smooth degradation of performance um, for, for noisy types. So we, we can even see some lift even when you're uh, you know 75% of the types being incorrect. Um, and the model can still achieve slight gains over no types and even at 100% noisy types, it's, you know, even if all your types are noisy, it's not necessarily doing worse. So, so that's also a good sign. So that's a wrap on the second half of the talk. So in summary, Tabby trains by encoders on knowledge graph types and unstructured text and improves tail retrieval. Uh, you can check out our paper, code for more experiments. Um, and here's a few picture of the, pictures of the people who worked on this effort, links to paper, blog, code below. Uh, this code, this QR code will take you to a blog post where you can find, uh, you know, everything linked again. I wanted to briefly take a step back and take a moment to summarize some of our key lessons from this line of work and talk about some of the key points of what we were trying to do. So the first point, if you think back to part one, was that we were really interested in looking at contrastive loss from a geometric perspective. And we kind of view this as an alternative to more traditional ways of thinking about general generalization. So instead of looking at things from a traditional perspective of the size of a model and its generalization error, we want to look at what happens to the geometry as you train. And we're curious whether we can take these ideas and apply them even further to settings where models are even bigger and more black box like foundation models. The second thing we were trying to exploit here was exploiting structured information to patch model errors. So can we use our understanding of the type of the geometry that contrastive learning is going to encourage and use that to improve model performance? So we did that very explicitly with entity types in Tabby, but there's all sorts of settings where it might be possible to use other sorts of structured data, and we're really interested in some of those questions. So briefly, a, a short preview of some future directions that we're excited about. Um, we've largely focused on supervised contrastive loss in this talk. That's really because it does something kind of very extreme in the geometry, uh, which is that class collapse phenomenon. So we took that and kind of made it a foothold to more broadly studying the geometry of contrast contrastive learning. But we're curious to see how we can understand extend our insights in other settings where there isn't necessarily a supervised element. The bi encoder work in Tabby also suggests some natural connections to multimodal settings like clip. Uh, these are settings where you have a bi encoder from two mod modalities like images and text. I'm curious how we can use some of our insights there as well. Finally, one of the uh, more negative properties or you know, not exclusively positive properties of contrastive learning that I haven't mentioned really so far is that it really takes a super long time to train, uh, way longer than, than you would expect from kind of traditional training methods. That's because of the quadratic nature of making all those comparisons. So usually when you're training a model, uh, as your data set uh, increases, the training time increases linearly. You only have to you know, look at each data point once. When you're making all these comparisons, every time you uh, as the size of your data set grows, the number of comparisons you have to make grows quadratically because you suddenly have to start making all the comparisons, um, all those n squared comparisons across your whole data set. So I'm curious if you know there are ways to break this dependence. Um, I'm you know if you're if you're in if you're in the lab, you know I'm very excited about this um, and uh, re really interested in, in looking at this more.
So that's a wrap on our, on our talk. So here, again, here's the three papers that make up the bulk of this work, as well as a QR code on the screen that will send us to a blog post that kind of connects all those pieces together. And yeah, so that that is all. Great. Awesome, Lynn, thanks. Um, a quick reminder to folks in the audience, send your questions in and um, we'll you know get those across to Dan. Um, yeah, I guess to kick things off, um, yeah, my first question is kind of maybe a little bit more basic about, uh, you know, the first part of your talk, um, where you, um, you know, mentioned this kind of, uh, permutation, uh, class fixing permutation invariance, uh, kind of, uh, uh, property or problem that you're trying to address, uh, for the geometry. And one of the things that I was, uh, maybe like, uh, wondering was um, you had this like slide where you showed you know this um, this kind of uh, scatter plot of these points and then you kind of had these boundaries for the subclasses right and then right. Uh, um, it's nice because you can separate those subclasses so I think one of the things I was wondering is like um, do you uh, inject any information about what those subclasses are going to be when you do the transfer later because like uh, you can imagine that like uh, you know, a certain geometry might be really good for certain subclasses, but maybe there's another way to slice the data uh, into different types of subclasses. You know, like if you're doing animals, then maybe it's like you can do animal breeds, but maybe it's also about where those animals are. So maybe you can split it based on, you know, uh, foliage or something like that. That's a little bit different in terms of, you know, what kind of characteristics might be useful downstream. So I'm just wondering, you know, how you think about that. And like, is that something that like, is possible to do, or is, is it like you can do both cases, or is it more like you know, uh, you kind of get um, what you get essentially with, with with how you train? Right. So that that's a really interesting question. Um, so kind of to to answer kind of the more mechanical part. So how we evaluate uh, how well the the, the subclass clustering uh, worked and how well we we're actually able to. Um, to, to recover those pieces. So the way that we do it is we we will use labels for the fine grain classes in order to do that evaluation, but we won't let the embeddings themselves change because you're totally right. Like, uh, and you could actually have it uh, have it be the case that the same embedding can split by foliage and split by animal, um, and and everything would be the same. So when we're evaluating, we we do use those those downstream labels. Um, there are certainly ways that if you knew the fine grain classes ahead of time, you can definitely incorporate those into the contrastive loss, like uh, intuitively. Um, if you think about it, maybe from a tabby perspective, you can add it as extra site information or extra structure data or something like that. Um, so you can definitely add those in when you're training the model. Um, the If you don't have those labels ahead of time, uh, one thing that we've thought about a little bit has been kind of what kinds of... Uh, what kinds of invariants do you try to encode through things like data augmentation or through things like the autoencoder? Um, so this is a part that's starting to get a, a little bit more more mysterious. Um, the 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 amounts of assumptions you have to make start start adding up before you can um, start kind of making uh, uh, a bit more reasonable progress. Um, but basically, if there are uh, you know you can imagine if you wanted to. Uh, you know, split things by color, then you wouldn't want to add in a color jitter augmentation because right. that could, um, you know, d do get rid of that invariance in your embedding. Um, so there, there are certainly ways. It's a little bit mysterious at the moment, but um, you know, figuring out that that exact connection is is really interesting. Okay, that makes sense. So it seems like you know, there's some um, some properties that the augmentation also injects into the geometry that. Um, right maybe it's worth studying in future work, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Then still on the first work, I'm actually very curious of the, basically, if I understand correctly, four different losses in the end that you combine together, right? Um, I think you showed the uh, results um, uh, briefly, but uh, also from an intuitive point of view, I'm curious to um, get an understanding on what is each loss doing and mm -hmm. which one is more important for which aspect of the performance. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about that. Gotcha. So uh, I think at the end of the day, there are there are three losses. Um, kind of turning them on and off will kind of give you four, four different uh, configurations. So uh, the first one is the supervised contrastive loss. So this is uh, really critical because um, 
if you're in a situation where you're mixing up cats and cars, you it's kind of very hard to, or, or if you're mixing up like animals with cars or something, it's going to be very hard to then go and try to separate. Oh, excuse me, to separate the, out the cats and dogs. So I think of the supervised piece as separating out those kind of bigger, bigger coarser pieces. Next, you have the uh, class conditional info and CE laws. And this is what this is doing is it's giving a little bit of spread in the geometry. Um, so I think, Piero, one of the things you were asking was what happens, like what kind of what role is each of these things playing? And one of the interesting things that we found was even if you use an autoencoder that will kind of, you know, maybe start preserving, trying to preserve those details, you can actually get in a situation where um, the embeddings are still almost completely collapsed. Um, the, the, in order to kind of wrap your head around that, you can imagine you have a 128 uh, dimensional embedding. And then if you just have supervised contrastive with an autoencoder, what it's going to try to do is it's going to try to get all those details to as few um uh, as few dimensions of that embedding as possible. And in that setting, you'll you'll be too far collapsed and then you actually also won't be able to transfer well. So what that class conditional info and C loss is really doing is it's giving you a bit of that geometry. And then what the autoencoder and also data augmentation are doing is it's uh, trying to uh, enforce some some subclass cl clustering properties within the within the course classes. And then that's what's actually going to let you separate out those fine grained classes. So that's kind of what each piece is doing. Um, so you have one that's separating out the, the oh, sorry, the, the course pieces, and then one that's giving you a bit of spread so that you have some chance of separating out the fine classes. Got it, got it. That makes a lot of sense. I was actually imagining that both the augmentation and yes, and the augmentation, I mean, I was mentioning four because I'm Counted also augmentation, which is not actually a loss, but um, it's another component of the system, I would say. Um, both the augmentation and the reconstruction coming from the auto decoder of the autoencoder, I was imagining that those could also be a form of regularization. Is that the case that you're observing, or is just you know just creating some more fine-grained distinction within the classes? That's a that's a really good question. I think making uh, thinking about it as a form of regularization is definitely a useful way to think about it um we have compared so when we train we we obviously also use kind of the the standard suite of regularizations um as well like dropout and and things like that um so there's uh there there's definitely that that's certainly one way to think about it um i'd say that uh you know one of the things that uh, I like about the the type of analysis that we did in this paper is that um, we were able to get a little bit more precise with exactly what we were, you know, quote unquote, regularizing for. Um, for example, like uh, we use inductive bias throughout our paper, but uh, a lot of times when people say inductive bias, it's kind of like a mysterious force, like just kind of, oh, the model does the right thing and I have no reason to explain how. Um, one of the things that I liked about our work is we were able to kind of identify a specific action or a specific mechanism that that was happening um mm -hmm. so in, in a sense yeah it's 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 a it's a type of regularization i'd say um and you know if you want to see exactly what's happening then you know we we have those those theorems to to help out right all right now that makes a lot of sense one very last thing that i would will say and ask regarding the the first work is um i think that there's also an interesting possible application here for uh, ranking problems and the reason why I'm saying so is that, you know, when I was at Uber, when we were working on um, um, ranking of Uber Eats, the Uber Eats recommender system, actually, when we ended up doing, we ended up um, having like a graph neural network approach where we're just obtaining the representations of users and dishes. And um, basically, if you think about it, I, uh, the, the class of the user and the dishes that they bought was kind of... a specific class and the ones that they didn't, didn't buy was another class. But within the ones that they buy, um, there is a ranking there, which is I bought this one way more, many more times, this one many less times. And so what we ended up doing there was just imposing, we were using a hinge loss there. And so mm -hmm. we were using actually having two different margins, one for the, um, let's say, positives, which are the ones that we actually, the, the, the top of the ranking, and the other like the weaker positives, which are like still positive, but lower in the ranking. And, you know, creating the distinction within the class was super useful. So I think that something very similar, like what, what you're doing, um, like ad adding a specific term for differentiating within the specific classes can be applied also to ranking um, um, problems. And so I encourage you to think about that. It could be like a really nice application.
Right. Yeah, yeah, that that sounds really interesting. We were thinking about it a little bit at some point, kind of you know, different levels of these labels. Um, and uh, in the toy examples that that we were like looking around in in a the the academic data sets there there wasn't that much interesting going on but it sounds like there's definitely a maybe an argument or a case here um right where you know reality is uh more interesting than <laughs> right. cfar <or> whatever <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, dan i wanted to pick on something that you mentioned only really in passing but i think it's an interesting question right you mentioned that how contrastive learning has some analogs in how people learn, right? And that leads you down like a very interesting kind of set of questions, right? So, um, you know, does experience in doing one help you do the other one better, right? Like are, are the most innovative ideas in the ML research community, is that coming from people who are already parents, right? Similarly, um, I guess, uh, does trying to teach a model how to do something make you a better parent, <laughs> right? Um, lots of questions to go down there, but I was thinking there's this one technique I know in kind of knowledge acquisition theory, which is about exposing, um, in this case, think of it as like a, a young athlete to two different extremes if you're trying to teach them a, kill, a skill in some kind of sport, right? So say that, that sport is soccer, you want to teach them how to kick a ball properly. You might first ask them to kick a ball with a perfectly straight leg and then ask them to kick it with a very bent leg, right? And then ask them to find that middle sweet spot where it's not perfectly straight, not perfectly bent, right? And in doing so, you kind of expose them to both like very extreme ways of doing things. And that allows them to kind of, you know, maybe the analog here is in reinforcement learning where you're exploring the state space properly, forcing it to explore the state space so it knows how the reward is adjusted. And I was curious if there's anything uh, along those lines in the kind of supervised learning uh, topic. Well, I'm glad you didn't ask me about my parenting strategies because uh, my best answer would be the closest thing I have is like that uh, that stuffed animal over there and it doesn't like really learn well. anything. <laughs> um, so to uh, actually the the point about the the athletes is a is a really um, interesting point and um, an analogy that I think is actually a a pretty apt way of thinking about how you train models. Um, the way the analogy I make is. Uh, there's like things that you can do in, in sports that will kind of make you better all sports. So the classic one is like strength training. So for more sports, for, so for most sports, if you're stronger, you'll be able to do the sport better. Um, and I think of things like, you know, pre-training or, you know, the mass language modeling or the, uh, unsupervised pre-training, like all the things that, that people do that aren't necessarily your end task. I think of those as, uh, maybe, you know, general sports conditioning, um, you know, increasing your VO2 max, uh, working out more, getting, uh, building up your muscles. Um, and then at the end, you can fine tune or, or these days, you know, adapters are, 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 are interesting as well. You can fine tune these models to do your specific task, but it, it really helps um, you be good at a sport if you have this base of strength um, behind it. So, uh, kind of the the modern wave of foundation models and all that. One way you can think about it is uh, suddenly we decided to uh, start making all our athletes way stronger and suddenly they can now throw things farther and run faster and, and do all these other things. Um, whereas before we were just sticking them on a treadmill for for days on end and being like, why can't you do push-ups? I put you on a treadmill um, and and something like that. Uh, the, the other more direct uh, connection is there's a field called curriculum learning where um, you decide kind of in what uh, what tasks you use in what order. Um, I think it's a little bit older of a field now. Um, uh, at some point when we, we realize that give a get a big enough model and train it on something dumb and something can do all these amazing things, uh, it's you know both an argument for that curriculum learning and idea, idea and a little bit uh, you know potentially nihilistic where just do a stupid thing and suddenly you can do all these smart things as well. I think it's kind of important sometimes to go through these analogies as like thought exercises uh, because we've been training machine learning models like relatively for a very short time in our history, right? But we've been working on ourselves for, you know, millennia, right? At least in recorded history. So mm -hmm. um, looking toward like making these analogies as many different ones as you can, whether it's the sports or the children or whatever it is. And then looking through the techniques of how we improve ourselves in those scenarios and then coming back and say, what's the analog here 
in how I'm training my model could lead to some interesting questions or maybe interesting answers. Definitely. I think I'll stick to sports and not worry about children yet. Maybe I've, you're a bit older than me, um, so maybe you you can let us know when, when you hit that stage. <laughs> okay, I want to get some questions in from the audience. So I think um, you got a few questions. Um, so Karthik was asking about um, uh, worst group robustness. So you talked a little bit about how um, you know Thanos uh, works pretty well on, um, I can't believe you call it Thanos, by the way, but uh, <laughs> works really well on uh, worst group robustness. So uh, he was wondering, can you shed some light on how Thanos influences, you know, generalization of the neural network um, more generally? And I guess maybe talk a little bit about the robustness results. Um, yeah, um, I can with a snap of my fingers. <laughs> um, so uh, we we didn't emphasize emphasize this as much in our paper, but. Uh, we also found that Thanos uh, improves just general overall accuracy um, as well by by a few points. Um, so if you like go to our paper, it's in some appendix, some some table somewhere where we found better um, model accuracy. Uh, I think there's also a bit of an analysis, uh, not in the Thanos paper, but in that, that first workshop paper about kind of overall accuracy. Um, and basically, it turns out if you're better able to distinguish those those subgroups, it turns out you can also do a little bit better um, on on the coarse grained groups, um, especially when if there's any case where there's you know the 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 subgroups or the overall groups are not um, have a little bit of overlap or, or anything like that. Um, so that that is something that that we found. We didn't uh, emphasize it as much, but. Um, yeah, it does. Uh, it it does, or it should help improve the generalization error, um, the general generalization error, and we we also saw it improve accuracy a little bit as well. Cool. Um, and then um, Sunny asks about um, applications. I guess uh, it sounds like it's like uh, either biometric or biomedical, but um, uh, I think what Sunny seems to be saying is that they're currently using triplet loss for that, and is wondering, you know if uh, a method like Thanos could be effective for, you know, transfer learning in those types of settings. So have you, have you looked at applications of, uh, of Thanos to medical settings of any kind? Uh, so we, we have some potential applications in the works um, to, to, to those medical settings, and we're hopeful that there will be helpful um, potentially with some things to do like segmentation and things like that. Um, in terms of triplet losses themselves, so if you're using a triplet loss, a triplet loss and a modern a kind of info and C loss are very applicable. So most of the insights with an info and C loss will also apply to a triplet loss. Um, sometimes the normalization can be a bit weird because with a triplet loss, instead of kind of doing all the comparisons across your whole batch, you only kind of do it for, for three things at once. Um, so I think certainly maybe like a supervised version of a triplet loss, uh, which is would kind of be the analog to supervised contrastive learning. I would imagine a lot of the same insights would apply. Cool. And um, Asavri asks about um, uh, the effect of class balance on um, this loss computation that you described. Like you, you talked about how you know if you increase the amount of data, it's uh, there's a quadratic. Uh, kind of dependence because you're trying to do these pairwise comparisons almost. Um, so um, is there some impact, you know, of other data properties like class balance or other things that, you know, kind of get in, in, in there or is that not an issue uh, generally? Right. Um, so uh, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Uh, so it turns out contrast, supervised contrastive learning in particular is very sensitive to, to class imbalance. Um, there's a great paper out there, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, something like Supervised Contrastive Prototype Learning or something like that, um, where they look at this in long-tailed settings. So these are settings where there's a few classes that kind of dominate, and then there's a bunch of little classes um, that, that all have very few things. So if you just kind of train naively with Supervised Contrastive in the setting, what ends up happening um, is that the uh, the, that dominant class ends up taking up a large proportion of your of your embedding space. Um, and you can kind of address this by saying, no, no, each class should kind of go to its own place in the space. So I, I know of at least that work, um, which, which was uh, very interesting. So yeah, it's it's definitely um, uh, yeah affected by the by the class imbalance there. Okay, uh, one, one last question on the contrastive learning side, and then maybe we can get in some quick questions on the you know, uh, the tabby work, but uh, Khaled had a question about um, 
uh, connections to hyperbolic embeddings. And he said like your description of the losses, you know, kind of made him think of hierarchies because you're describing kind of like, you know, super classes or classes and then subclasses inside. So is there some, you know, kind of uh, hyperbolic variants of this or, uh, or other ways to think about the geometry that might be helpful here? Yeah, certainly. I think that that would it's certainly a fruitful connection. And, you know, um, if, if someone out there uh, potentially in our lab uh, ha has the experience to, to look at that, then uh, it would certainly be a very interesting question. I think at some point we almost looked at it and I, I forget why we didn't, probably just because we ran out of time, um, one of those things, but it's definitely an interesting co connection. I would love to see kind of what happens there. Cool. Uh, so just to kick things off, I, I mean, we have like, uh, you know, five, seven minutes. So um, you know, there was a question again by Asavri about um, knowledge graph completion and whether that would have any impact on performance for tabby or introduce errors. So if you have missing information, I guess, um, you know, you can kind of do link prediction or whatever um, to, or no prediction to try to recover that, I guess. Um, so is that something that, you know, you guys have explored or uh, thought about uh, before? Yeah, so we haven't run, I, I don't think that we've run the experiment, but my guess would be uh, link prediction would be uh, kind of less useful than um, would probably be a bit more harmful than useful unless you're in the case where you literally have no types at all. Um, I say that because in our experiments, you can get down to super low type coverage. So a knowledge graph that is very incomplete, we can handle that just fine. Um, but performance will start degrading pretty quickly as soon as you start introducing um, kind of random noise uh, in, in, into the type into the type relation. So that would be my my feeling there, um, that, that would be my guess. Um, I think if you look at the Tabby paper, there may also be an experiment in there that suggests that Tabby does knowledge graph completion better than the knowledge graph methods. Um, don't quote me on that, go check the paper, but uh, you know that that's another reason why I wouldn't necessarily turn it on immediately. Okay, yeah, thanks. Still on Tabby, Dan, I actually have a, a, a question that is like, if you looked at the errors that the model makes, uh, I can imagine that they could be different than usual, right? Than, than you know, than without. Because I can imagine that usually it's a matter of an entity that is more popular could be the one that is returned by the model instead of the actual uh, long, like unpopular entity, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe in this case, it's not about that. Maybe in this case, the type of error is an entity of a similar type to the one that is the correct one instead of being the popular one. Have you looked at it? What, what, what did you discover? Yeah, so there's, as we were developing the method, kind of the, the error profile of what the errors were was kind of constantly changing. Um, so so my, my memory here may be a little bit out of date. Um, what I'll say is that uh, I think early on, it was definitely the case that when we first tried this idea before we started um, kind of tuning and playing around, it was very easy. It's very easy to get into a situation where your popular entity performance starts to tank um, because uh, the the type loss can be too strong. Um, so we had to tune that that quite. Um, uh, we had to tune that quite a bit. Um, basically, you don't want the model to start like ignoring the the name of the entity in terms of like just give me some random athlete instead of like looking for the one named Julius Caesar. Um, so that was definitely happening a little bit. Uh, so I, yeah, I think at some points, you know, the, there, there were some errors that had to do with, oh, like it was getting an athlete, but it was the wrong athlete and things like that. Um, in our final method, I think most of those things were tuned, um, to tuned properly so that those particular types of errors were, were not occurring anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are definitely still, still more errors to make. I think, you know, there are, um, there, there are always going to be. Uh, you know, one, one tricky part was, was uh, figuring out exactly where in the type hierarchy we wanted to run the method. So uh, if you had a type like person versus uh, building, then obviously it's not, it's not going to help you with Julius Caesar because Julius Caesar is a person. Um, and, and on the flip side, if your types are way too fine, then they can't really learn to generalize from seeing other examples. So we, we had to fiddle with that and play with that quite a bit. Um, and, and, you know, depending on on what we did, kind of the the error profile would would change uh, accordingly. Got it. That's interesting. It also, maybe suggest to finding a way to use multiple levels also in the right. in the somehow in the loss, right? 
yeah yeah that that that's something that we're very very interested in uh i think again we wrote it on the whiteboard at some point um and then uh I did, didn't get around to uh to uh looking into it cool um i think we're almost at time uh, one last comment i think when you had that slide with uh, you know what team does you see the play on then i was like well you know it's not that like it's a it's a different way to put the but the question about you know uh um what side was julius caesar on you know because like colloquially it might make sense as a sentence so uh the answer might be romans um but <laughs> yeah i i had a similar reaction when we we're putting those examples together um in our paper we say what team does george washington play on and i'm like america <laughs> is that the answer <laughs> um, team but, freedom <laughs> yeah team freedom yeah. exactly um mm -hmm. But yeah, that's uh, it's it's an interesting thing thing to think about. I think the yeah. the thing about you know these these systems is they're they're quite subtle. So I think we picked on team and play precisely because there was this bit of subtlety where maybe you could like squint and say, oh, I did give you the right answer, like freedom. Right, right. Um, but uh, you know, getting it to there there are you know other examples where. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think Laurel would love to use like how much does a Lincoln cost or something. Um right. and then you have to get the link in the right. car, not link in the president. But like, I don't know, maybe you're talking about the Lincoln Memorial or something. <laughs> yeah, but that that's a that those philosophical questions are definitely interesting. All right. Um uh thanks a lot, Dan, for uh telling us what you've been up to. And uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for tuning in today. Um, go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu, sign up to our mailing list, and um, we'll send you one email a week, I think, roughly, um, about what talk is coming up. Um, we do not spam. Um, also, subscribe to the YouTube so we can, I think, uh, try to hit 10K subs, hopefully, uh, by summer. Uh, we can make that a target. Um, and I think next week we have Arjun Akula uh from uh google talking to us about um robustness and interpretability and vision and language grounding models so thanks everyone uh see you next week bye bye everyone